welcome to the New Smyrna Museum of History, your headquarters for history right here in Southeast Volusia County. Uh, we're here today for a virtual program called Archaeology Works, uh, and I'm being joined by Emily Jane Murray with the Florida Public Archaeology Network uh, here in the Northeast region of Florida. And um, we're excited about today's program. We've done several of these over the summer, uh, but this is going to be the first time we've had a chance to uh, to visit and uh, view the information on the STARS program. So we're real excited about that today. Uh, Emily Jane Murray uh, has a master's degree in anthropology from Brandeis University, where she focused on public archaeology and site museums in Northeast Florida. She also holds a bachelor's in communication from Flagler College. She's excavated sites throughout the southeastern United States and cr created numerous outreach tools, including videos, activities, and museum displays. She currently works as a public archaeology coordinator for the Florida Public Archaeology Network Northeast Region and serves on the boards of the St. Augustine Archaeological Association, the Florida Anthropological Society, and the St. John's County Cultural Resources Review Board. She is also a founding member of the Florida chapter of the Association of Gravestone Studies, and her interests include Florida prehistoric archaeology, historic cemeteries, and public archaeology and interpretation. Um, please join me in welcoming Emily Jane Murray. Welcome, everyone, and thanks to Greg and the museum for having us today. It's always fun to come hang out um, and do archaeology works programs with you guys. Um, so this is a, a series of workshops that we designed. Uh, I've been to tons of lectures and talked with archaeologists, and they all want to tell you what they found and what it uh, what it means. But we don't often hear how they found it, what they actually found, like all the dirty stuff, you know, all the stuff that was buried in the ground, um, and how they got to that conclusion of what it all means about people in the past. Um, so this is a program where we really look at the materials behind it and the methods and and how we. Um, kind of learn a little more um, how we do that learning about the past. So today we're going to talk a little bit about stars. Um, and essentially we're going to talk about archaeoastronomy. And you may be able to guess uh, from that word what it means. Archaeo is uh, archaeology. We're studying people from the past. Uh, and then astronomy. So we're studying how people in the past um, their astronomical knowledge, what they knew about the stars, what they knew about the sky, what they knew about all of those things uh, up there moving around. Um, and it does kind of, we end up getting at other types of things, um, cosmology, how people understood the universe. Um, some of this can be, um, you know, religion, but it also science is a way that we understand the universe. So kind of thinking about uh, how people look around and make sense of it all. Um, calendrics, right? Making calendars, using calendars, um, how that helps us think about uh, time and, and the seasons and change and um, all those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, time is very much tied to um, things like how the earth rotates around the sun, right? Um, and then ethnoastronomy and cultural astronomy. So we can also talk to uh, contemporary societies, we can talk to descendant communities, and we can get at some of those oral histories, the traditions, the stories people pass down. Um, and then those can all be kind of important in, in kind of thinking about people from the past and what they thought of the, the skies. So what do we know? Um, well, we know there's a lot of oral histories and there's a lot of stories that involve the sky. Um, I'm sure we've all been told a story about a constellation or a star, right? And a lot of those stories have been passed down through generations through our culture. And so lots of other cultures have similar experiences where they get told stories about the, the sky and the stars and um, and what else was, was going on. Um, we know you can use the stars for navigation um, and not just, you know, going from one place to another, but also linking the, the communities. So it's not just a matter of me, uh, you know, traveling across the state. It's also what am I going to bring with me? What ideas am I going to bring with me? Um, what what items am I going to bring with me? Um, so the stars are a way that we can see how communities relinked and how people kind of moved across the landscape. Uh, as I say, seasons and time really closely tied to to some of these things. So thinking about that. Um, and then artistic expression, architecture, all of these things can be pretty closely tied with, uh, you know, with the stars, with the sun. 
Um, we can see drawings of stars. Uh, we can see people interpreting, you know, what the, the, the skies and the heavens mean on paper or on, on stone or bone, you know, all sorts of artwork. Um, so all of these things, you know, are both um, ways we can study archaeoastronomy. So looking at oral history, looking at architecture, um, but archaeoastronomy can also help us uh, get at some of those stories, some of those traditions, uh, and help us understand some of the art and architecture that we see. So there is a little bit of uh, science to the stars, you know, things move around in accordance to physics and all sorts of laws and geometry and all. Um, so you do have to kind of understand how some of these things work to be able to understand um, some of the work that we do in archaeoastronomy. The first thing to, to know is that the sky has changed. So the sky that we see today is not the same sky that people saw 5,000 years ago, and it's not going to be the same sky, sky that people see 5,000 years in the future. And there's a couple different things that happen. Um, you know, first of all, we are moving, right? We're moving around the, uh, the sun, um, but the Earth itself is also spinning. And when things spin, uh, they don't stay perfectly on an axis. So if anyone has ever played with a top, you'll know it doesn't stay perfectly straight up and down and spin, right? It gets some wobble to it. So this is called precession. And the Earth has some of that. It has some wobble to it. Um, so what this means is through time, it kind of moves one way and moves the other. Um, and one great example that we can see of this is that the North Star, and today we, we know the North Star is Polaris. So this is the star that is up above the North Pole. Um, it's not always been Polaris. So about 5,000 years ago, it was a star named Thuban. Uh, and if I don't think anyone of one of us will live long enough to see, but uh, at some point in the future, the star is going to become Vega. That will become the new North Star. So, um, so we're moving. Uh, everything else out there in the universe is also moving and exploding and condensing and forming new stars and splitting uh, apart old stars and. Um, so lots of things are going up there. So this is just a cool little illustration of uh, what the Big Dipper looked like in the past, what it kind of looks like now, and it's going to keep moving and changing in the future. Um, so it's important to think about that, um, you know, at what point in time we're looking at is going to affect what the stars look like and, and what was going on. Um, so big time scale, but also smaller time scale, right? The seasons affect um, what stars we see, they affect where the sun and the moon rise. Um, and part of this is because of, you know, how the Earth's tilted and where we are in position to the sun and to everything else in the universe. Um, so that can affect uh, what we're going to see. Uh, we also get the solstices and the equinoxes as part of the seasonal transition that we see. Um, so uh, we get these things, uh, archaeologists and, and love to talk about celestial azimuths. And so what this means is um, it's a line uh, based off of north as to where something's happening. Um, so the solstice and equinoxes are actually a natural phenomenon that happens in which um, the sun will kind of move across the horizon. It moves across the landscape. So on the equinoxes, and just this week we had the optimal equinox. So if anyone was uh, super clever and got out there early morning to see the sunrise, and you looked straight due east, um, you would have seen the sun there. Um, as we get closer to the winter solstice, which is um, in December, um, the sun's actually going to move further and further away from being due east, and it's going to go um, further south on the horizon. Um, and as we get closer to the summer solstice, it moves back north, right? And we, it crosses over during the spring equinox, and it ends up uh, further north uh, during the summertime. Um, and it, so this is uh, one of those reasons that those, everyone always talks about alignments with solstices and equinoxes is because the sun's kind of moving. So um, you can see here in the right image kind of what it looks like on the ground uh, for us to see. If you're on the equator, uh, you can see the, the sun perfectly north, uh, excuse me, east-west uh, on the equinox. And then how it's off uh, 23 and a half degrees on those other those other dates. Um, the moon also does this, so it, it doesn't uh, go at the same uh, place on the horizon, there's uh, minimums, uh, maximums, like one way and the other as well. So, um, and then where you are in the world. So, you know, noting the season changes and the earth moves around differently. So, right, we're going to see different things in the, in the, the sky, uh, depending on where you are, different times of the year. 
Um, also, just basically, you know, where are you on the landscape? If you're in a heavily wooded area, you're not going to see as many stars as you were as if you were out in the desert, right, where there's wide open spaces. Um, so that's another thing to think about is what kind of landscape are people living in? Uh, and so what kind of, how much of the sky are they going to see, right? And we've added another thing to, to think about. We've added a problem here um, with our current views of the skies. Um, you know, I am here in the suburbs and uh, there's, you know, not too big of cities near me, but there's still plenty of folks who like to leave their porch lights on all night long. Um, so I'm not going to see as many stars as I might out in Death Valley, um, but I'm probably going to see more than if I were in downtown Jacksonville or downtown Miami where there's lots of big buildings and lots more light. Um, and this is light pollution, right? The more ambient light, the more light you have around you, the less you can see up in the, the sky. Um, so this is a photo from Death Valley where there's just nothing for miles and miles. Um, and you can see the full Milky Way and just gazillions of stars. So that's really cool. If you ever have the chance to go to a place uh, that's really dark and to see a lot of great stars, you know, absolutely go for it. I was in Nantucket and um, I didn't think about it, but it's way off offshore off the coast right so there's not a lot to block your view uh, and it's pretty dark so really cool to see all of those stars uh, there's a cool website that is basically a free planetarium so you can log on to it we sent it out the link in the um, workshop notes it's called stellarium.org and you can type in a time a date a location and it'll show you what the night sky looks like um, and so that's really fun to play with. You can go away in the past, you can look in the future, you can see what stars you may be able to see tonight. Um, and it also has a feature that you can add on um, Star Lore, so you can actually map in some of the constellations and see, uh, you know, them just as the, the dots connected with a stick. One of the features that I like is it'll actually put, you know, Ursa Major, it'll actually put a picture of a bear on top of the stars, because I always wonder sometimes, how did they figure out, like, how does that look like an animal or a bear or a person um, so that can help you visualize them a little a little better um, so check out that website great way to lose a few hours of your life let me tell you <laughs> um, so just to, to look at some archaeoastronomy at work some different examples of things we're going to start with some pretty uh, basic concepts and move into some headier ones so get ready for some good cosmology at the end um, starting with calendars uh, we have a calendar that is based on celestial bodies right now. Does anyone know, um, if you can type into the chat box, what, uh, what thing in the, star, in the sky our, our calendar is based on? Um, and we've chosen to divide, you know, the time up by months and by days and hours and minutes and seconds. A lot of that's arbitrary. We could have chosen 15 months instead of 12. We could have chosen, um, four months, right? And so we just, we, whoever, uh, the ancient Romans figured that out and picked it out and that's the kind of calendar we have now. Um, but other cultures measure things in slightly different ways. So um, this is a lunar stick, which is a uh, calendar from the Winnebago tribe, which is up north. Um, so we, our calendar is based on the solar, it's, it's a solar calendar, it's based on the sun. Um, so this is a calendar based on the moon. So you can see uh, kind of the drawings at the bottom of what's carved onto the stick and the phases of the moon. There's different uh, hash marks there to represent different time periods as well. Um, and then there's uh, one of the, the more famous calendars is the Maya calendar. And this is actually used by a lot of Maya folks still today in places like Guatemala. Uh, and they have, uh, once again, a couple different ways of, of segregating time. Like we have, uh, you know, hours and, and days and months in years, they have similar uh, ways of breaking up times. Um, and they actually have kind of two calendars that help go together. So you use this wheel to kind of map everything out. Uh, and I think one of the big things that came up a few years ago is that the Maya calendar was ending. It's the end of the world. Um, but calendars are often cyclical. Our calendars are cyclical, right? We each we reach uh, December 31st. And then where do we go? Back to the getting, January 1st. Um, so they just hadn't written out as many uh, cycles as as we have uh, gone through now since since they were writing it out years ago. So 
Um, so those are some good examples of physical calendars. We also see plenty of oral histories and traditions that are types of calendars. Uh, and if you think about a farmer's almanac, this is a good one, right, where it tells you um, when the best time to plant crops are, when the best time to, to sow the crops, uh, you know, and to harvest and, uh, and to do all sorts of things. And a lot of this is based on the moon, the sun, you know, all of these different kind of things that are happening. Um, I recently read, I think it's Foxfire book, which is a collection of um, history and lores and cultural practices and practical knowledge that was collected from uh, folks in Appalachia back in the 1960s. And they had a whole book on um, astrology, so the different signs, which is based on the planets and, you know, the sun and everything moving around. And, uh, you know, they had it down to what's the best day of the month to plant things and which would, which is the most auspicious day to harvest your root vegetables, right? So all of these things are types of calendars um, that we're just sharing with one another and passing down that, that history uh, and that knowledge. Uh, we see the recording of different astronomical events. There's a really cool thing that happens on July 5th, 1054. And this is a supernova. So this is a star that just explodes and it gets big and fiery and brighter. Um, and I think a chunk of it shot off and became a whole new thing. Um, and this was written about, it, it lasted two or three years. It started uh, on July 5th, but it lasted two or three years. And it's written about um, in Japan and China and the Arab world. It's written about in Europe. All these different resources, uh, you know, talk about this big explosion and, and bright thing happening in the sky. Uh, and there's some folks that think over in Chaco Canyon, which is in the American Southwest, that they've even drawn, uh, you can see there's the, the crescent moons and there's these big uh, stars kind of drawn here. Um, and that, that it, that's depicting it because the time frame it all kind of lines up. So pretty cool to see that. Uh, navigating by the stars is another really big thing, uh, how people used to get around before they had fancy GPS devices. Uh, and we even still rely on some of this today. A lot of um, people do orienteering still, which is figuring out where to go based on um, cardinal directions. And often you can use clues like where the sun is or where certain stars are to help you figure that out. Um, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. Ptolemy starts talking about using uh, a tool called a quadrant. And he uses this to help him map some of the stars in the sky. Um, you can also use this to figure out heights. And that's a lot of what the navigation amounts to is figuring out, you know, heights and distances, uh, and that tells you where you are. So it's a lot of geometry. It's all about the angles, uh, and a lot of it's based on doing uh, triangles with a 45, 45, and 90 degrees, and doing some of that uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, and at the basic level, you know, you can find your latitude. So once again, thinking about the ways that we cut up the earth, there's, the, you know, the poles and the meridians. Um, and so if the sun uh, at noon on an equinox, uh, if you took a reading of that, that would be where you are, right? Um, but if you're uh, a different day of the year, you have to do a plus or minus to figure out because on the equinox, right, we know that it's going straight east and west. Um, so otherwise you have to calculate to figure out how far off of that straight east and west it is. And that will help you figure out where you are. Um, other useful ways you can figure this out is by looking at the North Star, and that works on any day of the year because it's uh, pretty steadily where it is, right? Um, so those are some ways to, to figure out where you are. Um, these are some cool examples of uh, really old uh, tools that were used. So the oldest mariner's astrolabe, so the oldest astrolabe that was used uh, by folks on boats to figure out where they were going, we found on a shipwreck dating to 1503. Um, and this is actually made out of metal. It looks, uh, it's, it's definitely been underwater for a little while. Looks a little rough there, but you can see the Portuguese uh, crest at the very top. Um, and, and so archeologists found this and they thought it was really cool and they couldn't quite figure out what it is. And they actually did um, 3D modeling of it and it helped kind of reveal these different um, uh, angles that you'll see in the top. And that blue, the blue image of it, the top right, um, you'll see all those arrows. And so these are different um, directions and, and angles that were on it. And so this is how they would figure out where they were. Um, this is the bottom photo is the Canterbury quadrant. So this is what a quadrant looks like. It's pretty much a, a fancy protractor. Um, and this was found uh, dating to 1388 uh, over in England. So it was used for 
um, not quite used for navigating, but for helping uh, map map things and map the sky and stuff. Uh, we do see moving forward in time, they develop, uh, seafarers develop a tool called a sextant. So these uh, have a few more moving parts and you're able to sight in um, something like the sun at the same time as you're sighting the horizon and get a measurement off of where it is. So it's a little bit um, fancier technology, uh, but it does kind of the same thing as the other as the other ones. So the monumental alignment that we see, and this is where we start to get a little, uh, a little interesting, um, trying to map in how Stonehenge relates to all of the stars and such. Um, and you know, some of it does get a little crazy. My favorite example is somebody who did an alignment of a site called Crystal River in Florida. Um, and there's a bunch of different mounds and landmarks there. And he starts trying to line all of those up with the stars in the sky. And then he goes, and then when you add the trees in, you see how they align. Uh, and somebody had to politely, you know, make him realize that the trees are not as old as the archaeological site. They were new, newer trees. So they were not there and were not part of any sort of original configuration that happened. Uh, a lot of them were probably squirrel trees, right? They just got acorns planted. Um, but there are a lot of sites that do align. Um, and we see this throughout the world. We see this throughout time where people are, you know, building structures or creating landscapes or even, you know, basing a whole community design um, on, you know, where the sun rises, where the sun sets, where um, different uh, celestial azimuths are, right? So those solstices and equinoxes and lunar maximum where the things are coming up on the horizon. Um, and just to put this in perspective a little, you know, if we look at a lot of cities today, they the streets align with cardinal directions. That's doing this alignment, you know, so it's not uh, anything that gets too heady and, and crazy in the clouds. It can be something as simple as um, it's cold here and I'm going to point my, my house where I get the maximum sunlight in the winter in the morning to warm up my house, right? That's doing one of these alignments. But to look at some really cool sites that we see, um, there's a tomb that's about 5,000 years old in Newgrange, Ireland, um, and it aligns uh, to the sunrise of the winter solstice. So what this means is um, the site, which it's uh, basically a rock tomb, so it's a rock-lined uh, structure under this big earthen berm, um, and there's a hole in the front of it. And if you go out to the site on the winter solstice, uh, and watch the sunrise, the sun will hit perfectly into that hole and, and fill the chamber, right? And, and it beams down into the chamber in a really cool way. Chichen Itza in Mexico is another cool site where we see this on the equinoxes. Uh, the sun rises uh, in such a way that it casts the shadow of the steps. Uh, of kind of the stepping feature of the pyramid onto where the steps are. And you can see at the very bottom, there's like a serpent's head and he kind of zigzags up, up the side of it. So that's a really cool, cool thing to see. And then back to Chaco Canyon, which is out in New Mexico. Um, it's about a thousand years old. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas about some of the alignments with this site and how the buildings, um, you know, how the how the buildings align with things um, in, in different celestial events and azimuths and such. Um, but one of the coolest things is uh, in a certain building there, they have this thing called the sun dagger. Uh, and so what it is, is it's petroglyphs on a wall and then there's a couple of rocks in front of it. And on the summer solstice, the sun aligns where it shines uh, one beam of light in the middle of the petroglyph. So here's an image of what that looks like. And then on the winter solstice, the sun has shifted 23 plus degrees, 46 degrees, I guess, in the other direction, right? Um, and so it hits a different set of rocks and it creates two, two daggers on either side of that petroglyph. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. And um, once again, it's hard to, you know, maybe it was a coincidence, but that's that's too that's too cool to be a coincidence. Um, looking at a couple of sites that we see here in Florida, um, if we go over to the west coast, um, kind of near near Cedar Key, um, there's a site called Shell Mound, a very specific, I know it's it's a very <laughs> very generic name. 
is my joke here. Um, but it is uh, on the, the Gulf and it is built, uh, you can see it down at the very bottom, you are here. Um, it is built on the side of this dune. And um, a lot of dunes from the time period uh, of this site actually tend to line up with these um, summer solstice and winter solstice uh, events. And part of that is just actually just how the wind was blowing at the time. Um, so these dunes were naturally created, but then what happens is people find them on the landscape and they recognize um, the alignments that happen. Um, so a lot of the archeological evidence uh, that was found while digging at this site is that people were here at the, you know, around the summer solstice having massive feast. And they figured that out based on um, when shellfish were harvested, when certain birds would have been migrating into the area and been readily available, um, looking at fish remains, looking at plants and pollen, you know, when are these things available um, to be consumed? And that's, it, it aligns up really well with when the summer solstice is. So um, there's quite a few sites out in the Gulf that have uh, these kinds of alignments. Um, you'll see that the uh, the shoreline was a lot bigger, so these weren't quite on the marsh when all of this was happening. Um, so Shell Mound Palmetto is is uh, down in the right hand uh, side. I can't, I'm not sure if you guys see my mouse waving or not. So I'm trying to also give verbal instructions, um, but it aligns, you know, with that summer solstice sunrise and uh, winter solstice sunset. And you'll see there's other sites that are kind of on similar lines where they have some of those alignments as well. Um, there's uh, another whole crazy, really cool group of sites down in um, South Florida. Uh, it's called collectively the Belgrade culture. Um, that archaeologists have kind of assigned that name to the time and the uh, the place and the, the cultural attributes we see. And they have all sorts of really crazy shaped, uh, huge, I mean, it's not just, you know, it's a big, a huge site. It's like a big community that was there um, where they have mounds and they have, um, uh, earthen works and, and, and different uh, tunnels and, and berms and all sorts of things going on. So this is a site called Big Mound City, um, which is one of them. And uh, archaeologists have figured out that there's a huge, a huge assortment of them that align with some of these solstice events and equinox events and all within two degrees of, of matching up. So that might explain some of the architecture. Um, they also line up with the water. So how the water flows, where the water flows, um, is all kind of related. Uh, so here's some of those alignments from a paper uh, Dr. Uh, Nate Lowry's has published, and I recreated one of them a little easier to see. Um, so it's crazy architecture, and it's got all these fingers sticking out. But when we look at um, the solstice, the two solstices, we see that that creates one of the fingers, and the, the lunar maximums create two other fingers, and the equinox creates another. Um, and then they all kind of connect and, and cross over this big uh, platform mound at the bottom. So there's a lot of interesting thoughts about some of this and, you know, how do we, you know, what, what does all of that mean, right, is some of the questions that I always think, well, what does that tell us? Um, but if you think about, um, you know, Florida environment is very much connected to wet seasons, dry seasons, especially in the Everglades where water flows faster at different times of the year. Um, a lot of that has to also impact um, what animals are there, uh, what plants are growing at the time. And so that, uh, you know, then in turn equates to what the stars are doing, what the sun's doing, right? So all of these things are kind of related together. Um, and that lets us know a little about how, how closely people are paying attention and um, some interesting things to think about what all of that means. Uh, it's not just really old cultures, it's not just native cultures, it's not just, you know, different cultures from ours uh, that are doing these alignments. Um, churches are often aligned, right, where the altar faces the, the east, um, burials and cemeteries, you often put the feet towards the east, right, all of these alignments happen uh, and more Western and definitely in Christian beliefs. Um, so the mission architecture, especially out in the Southwest, where we still have a lot of that architecture left, because um, it was built with different materials than we see here in Florida. In Florida, it was a lot of wooden structures. Out West, it was a lot of stone structures, so they lasted a little longer. Um, but there's tales of the, um, the friars and the priests. They would put a pole in the ground, and they would watch it for a few days as the sun went around it and make marks of you know, the shadow that it cast, and that's how they figured out the cardinal directions to build um, some of the churches and the buildings that they built. 
Uh, and then there's some other ones that are really special. There were some that were not quite, you know, east, west, north, south. They were off in this weird way. Um, and folks kind of, I guess, maybe rediscovered is the, the best term, uh, that they align with things like the winter solstice. So this is the uh, the church at Mission San Juan Baptista in California. And on the winter solstice, if you open the door, the sun comes in and illuminates uh, the, the altar in just a beautiful way. So, so that gets us to the biggest, most abstract things to think about with some of this. Um, cosmology, you know, how do we make sense of the world? And then ontology, where do we fall in the place of some of these things? Um, and we see, you know, these celestial bodies are, are very important to a lot of the, the stories of the cultures that we know about, and we can only speculate about how, you know, some of the cultures that we know less about, uh, how they could play a role. Uh, one of the big things, you know, is the, the Aztec sun wheel, right? This is the whole cosmology of the Aztec world uh, kind of transcribed into this, and it has to do with the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all sorts of things on Earth as well. But um, it gets into to some of those other things. Um, if you're really interested in a, a deep dive read on some of these things, I would recommend a book called An Archaeology of the Cosmos. Um, and he really does talk about uh, kind of religion and uh, a lot of archaeoastronomy uh, and trying to get at some of those things through archaeoastronomy with alignments and architecture and art and all sorts of things. Um, and he looks specifically at uh, some sites here in North America versus a lot of other books kind of look at Aztec and Maya and, and, and Stonehenge and all these other sites that are a little farther afield than, uh, than North America, but still pretty cool. Um, in a lot of uh, kind of Southeastern Native American cultures, you know, we do see that there is uh, very distinctively three worlds. So there's the upper worlds and that's the sky and the stars and the sun and the moon and all of those things. Uh, and then there's a lower world um, and then we're kind of on this in-between space, right? So we, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, ways of moving in between them and, and, and significance of, of art and architecture and how that's described. Um, but we see, you know, just through all sorts of cultures time and time again, how you know, the sky and the stars and all are a big part of, of that worldview and understanding that. Um, and constellations often play a big part in some of this. If we think about the constellations that we look at and identify and talk about, um, they're not constellations that any, anyone in America made up. They're not constellations that anyone in Europe made up. Right? They go back to uh, ancient Greek and Roman mythology a lot of times. And so those are stories that, um, you know, Western civilization kind of our culture has told over and over and over again and passed down through generations across hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and so that's just one example, you know, once again, we can look at other cultures and, and start to learn some of the stories that they've told and, and how that kind of helps them, you know, make sense of, of natural phenomenon, how it uh, helps them uh, tell stories and parables that teach kids how to, to do things or what not to do. Um, and also, you know, just uh, different cultural practices that may be tied in with that. So. Um, it's a lot, a lot of things to think about and consider, but if you guys have questions, I can try to answer them. Um, we did include some instructions on how to make um, quadrants to go out and you can measure things. Uh, there are a couple different websites where you can uh, print one out and you can work on your measurement skills and figuring out how tall a tree is or a clock or something on your wall. Um, and then there was also a star chart, a website that you could go and download a star chart and go look for some stars and constellations tonight. So, All right, Emily, are we going to uh, open it up for questions? Anybody uh, have a question for Emily? This would be the time to ask. Go ahead and open your microphone up there and ask away. I have a question. What's your question? Um, why do some constellations show up in different seasons? Oh, that has to do with how the Earth moves around. Um, so sometimes we're, you know, way over here, and sometimes we're way over here, and the Earth tilts too. Um, so if you think about just moving around a room, right, where you are at different points in the room, you're going to have different 
you're going to see different things, right? You're going to have a different perspective on it. So, um, so that's what happens. The earth is moving around and spinning. And so we get different perspectives on the night sky. Okay. I have another question. How long have constellations okay. and where did they come from? How long where has constellations been there? been there? Like in the sky. And where did they come from? Um, so, I mean, stars, as far as I know, have like always been in the sky, right? Uh, and that's one of those big questions uh, that astrophysicists try to figure out is where do stars begin and where did they end? Um, so I would say, I bet constellations have been around as long as people have been looking at the stars and telling stories about them. So probably, you know, thousands of years. Um, and a lot of the constellations that we know of today come from Greek mythology. But if you ask, uh, you know, a Cherokee person, they're going to have different constellations and different stories to tell about them. Um, or if you ask somebody in China, they would have different stories and different constellations. Absolutely. So a lot of it has to do with our culture and where we're from. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. It looks um, like we got another I question. Go ahead with your question. You've got your hand up. Um. I heard that th that the days of the weeks were from the names of the planets. Some of them are, and some of them um, are from uh, from different gods too. So Sunday, I'm pretty sure it's from the sun, um, but Thursday I've heard is from Thor's day, and Thor was actually a um, like a Scandinavian god, a Viking god. So, um, but um, the Greek folks did name, uh, we did name planets after a lot of the Greek gods, so. Oh. And Roman ones. All right, did anyone else have any questions? Maybe we have one more. Um, there's one more question that I want to ask, um, and it's, um, how were pyramids made? Uh, a lot of engineering and a lot of manpower. So they would have to go carve out rocks, or they would, um, depending on the types of pyramids, some of them are made out of stones that they would have to cut into blocks. Some of them are made out of concrete and cement that they would mold, uh, mold together into blocks. And then they had to do a lot of math and geometry to figure out how to get them to stack perfectly. So big engineering feat and. I don't even know if we fully understand how some of them were mermaids still, but some very smart people. <laughs> thank you for my, thank you for answering my question. Welcome, thank you for watching. <laughs>